Hi there, this is Erica Merrill, and I'm the founder of Perfect Legal Video, and I'm very excited to have attorney Brian Jones, criminal defense attorney out of Ohio, here with us today. We are going to be diving deep into forensic science and the law and criminal law in, in particular. So I wanna thank you so much, Brian, for joining us today for this interesting interview. Hi, Erica, I'm really excited about today's topic. This is, a, this is a really good one. I agree. So why don't we just start with the definition of, you know, what is forensic science? What does that mean? So forensic science is uh, basically science in the courtroom. So uh, when you add the word forensic to any field, then you're talking about that field as it relates to courtrooms, litigation, trials, things of that nature. So forensic science is any science that is ultimately going to impact or uh, go into a case. Well, that's really good to know. Um, so you, I think pe most people know about forensic science from watching CSI and and other crime shows, I swear. I mean, it, you know, and there are there are people that are in the professions where they see it every single day. And you are in one of those professions, and so you've seen where it might hurt a case or help a case or where things can go wrong. And I wanted to, you know, before we get into what can go wrong and, and what can go right with these sorts of cases um, with forensic science. Can you tell us and give us some examples of uh, cases, you know, where forensic science has come into play for you? Absolutely, Erica. So we have had uh, sexual assault cases where forensic science has played a major role. We've had DUI cases where forensic science has played a major role. We've had drug possession cases where forensic science has played a major role. You know, for instance, we had a sexual assault allegation against a child where our client's DNA was found in that child's panties. And you would hear that fact, and I'm sure you and all of our viewers have heard that fact right now and said, oh my God, his DNA were, was in her panties. What we learned from our investigation was that the entire family's laundry was uh, tossed into uh, essentially a dirty laundry pile in their laundry room. And after it came out of the washer, it was all then put back into a clean laundry basket to be ready to be folded. And what we learned is two things when we worked with our uh, forensic DNA expert. First is that uh, putting a clothing item through a wash and dry cycle will not necessarily remove DNA from that clothing item. Second, by intermixing everybody's uh, clothing items into the same dirty clothes basket, wash cycle, and clean clothes basket, um, their DNA was, was all mixed up and intermingled. So there were about five, six people living in this house at the time that these allegations arose. And when we had other articles of items, I, articles of clothing tested, we were able to identify everybody's DNA um, on everybody else's clothing items. So what at first blush seemed to be an incredibly damning fact, um, an allegation against our client, and it turned out to be uh, absolutely nothing of any import whatsoever. Um, you know, we've had D DUI cases where blood and urine samples um, are left out in a laboratory for days or even weeks on end. And if you know anything about um, sugar, it ferments uh, over a period of time and fermentation turns and creates alcohol. And so our client's blood alcohol levels or urine alcohol levels were incorrectly increased because samples weren't taken care of properly. Um, we had a drug possession case where our client was caught with a certain number of uh, bindles of heroin, little packages of heroin. And that heroin was dumped out onto a scale uh, from their packaging to weigh the heroin. And then that heroin was by the lab analyst, then redivided into the various bindles. Those bindles were then sampled. Uh, a limited number of the, the bindles were chosen for actual testing to determine if there was a controlled substance in any of these bindles. Well, you may be able to conclude, Erica, that 
intermingling and mixing up all the samples uh, before you test them, now you don't know which samples were in fact narcotics and which were not narcotics. So in all three of these cases, we were able to use our investigative techniques in addition to our uh, knowledge of forensic science to create really favorable results for, for all three of these uh, clients. Wow, I mean, that's that sounds like you've really done your your research to even think of that because I, I mean, I'm not in the business, but I, I definitely wouldn't have thought of that and I, I definitely wouldn't have known a lot of those facts. So, I mean, it's a good thing for your client that, you know, they, they were able to, you know, find that out. Now, can the way that forensics tests are performed affect the results? Absolutely, Erica. What you mentioned earlier is absolutely true in regards to the vast majority of the public thinking that lab technicians and quote unquote forensic scientists are at, at some equal playing field with academic scientists um, and private industry scientists. The reality is that many of these labs, these state and federal labs, don't adhere to uh, proper scientific standards. The training that the lab technicians goes through are different. The techniques that these individual labs are often proprietary, meaning only these state labs perform the testing techniques the way that that individual lab performs the testing techniques. They don't share data with one another the way an academic lab or a professional lab share data with one another. So their testing results often can't be verified um, across a wide cross section. Um, you're, you're getting uh, what often people refer to as a feedback loop, a positive feedback loop, where they, they perform a test, the test comes out the way that they expect it to, uh, but nobody's in there saying, hey, um, there was an error in this testing process. So that, that lack of peer review, outside peer review, um, can often create very inappropriate results and inaccurate results. Um, you know, in reality, forensic testing should be done no differently than academic testing. It's got to be performed meticulously. You have to keep detailed records. Your results have to be repeatable. Um, and you should have peer review and constant variable compliance checks to make sure that the standards of these tests are met. And those are some you know, very high level ways that uh, these tests can go wrong and end up in wrongful convictions, Erica. Well, yeah, and, and that really ruins somebody's life. I mean, as we've mentioned in past interviews, if somebody is falsely accused or if, if the evidence wasn't collected correctly, so the conclusions came out um, that they were guilty when maybe they weren't. And so, you know, these people will end up losing their reputation, their job, their freedom, their family. Um, it's, it's, they're basically stripped of all of their humanity and uh, treated like an animal yeah. for the rest of their lives. So uh, I mean, don't, I, I don't want to go, you know, go ahead and, and say things that may or may not be true. Is there anything you want to add to that? Well, Erica, I, mean, I, I absolutely agree with you that um, the incarceration and the mass incarceration that we have in America isn't effective, and that is absolutely a topic for another day. Um, what, I, what I would also like to add on this topic today is that there's a variety of dangers that result in those wrongful convictions and result in, in that mass incarceration, uh, like cross-contamination, false positives, false negatives, um, and, and sample destruction that, that occurs all too often. Um, there have been cases across the country of a process called dry batching, where the lab technicians, rather than actually run the tests that they're supposed to be running, fake the test results. They just write down whatever numbers uh, they feel should be the result in a particular case. Um, one individual actually here in Ohio was caught dry batching cases. Um, and in her actual time in the lab, she was planning her wedding so she was purchasing party favors and planning venue location and um, you know doing all the things that a bride to be does when she's getting ready to get married you know that sort of miscarriage of justice 
is absolutely unacceptable in the criminal justice system. And that's the reason that we, through our investigative processes, make sure that we follow up and obtain this uh, packet of information called the bench notes. So it's the, uh, the lab technicians handwritten notes as they go step by step through the testing process. And then the actual machine printouts showing that these samples were in fact tested. That the machine was properly calibrated. Um, that the results are spit out in raw data so that we can review it and know that there is in fact raw data present to review. Um, and more importantly, in appropriate cases, have our expert witnesses review that raw data. Wow, that is really interesting and, and very sad to hear about because the amount of lives that were probably ruined uh, because of that woman is is terrible. And, uh, you know, as, as a result, they, it's just really hard to get your reputation and, and your job and your family back once you're sent to jail for a while, even if later on they find out that uh, none of it was true. I mean, I, I've heard plenty of stories where people have been in jail for 20 years before they find these things out. And so um, it, it, it sounds like it's pretty important for your attorney to know about forensic science. And I know that you, Brian, really do a lot of continuing education on the law and on all different aspects of criminal law, including uh, forensics. And I don't know if you can, you know, give us some examples of, you know, why this is important and, and some of the things that you've done. Absolutely, Erica. So it, it's important for a criminal defense attorney to know what the high level uh, techniques are for creating good forensic science. So care starts from the moment an agent arrives on a crime scene from collection. Um, they have to know who was present what was collected, how it was collected, and it goes all the way through the forensic testing process to the analysis and reporting of results. You, you don't put, a, a, let's say, a urine sample in a machine and the machine tells you, oh, that person was intoxicated. That machine spits out a graph and a lab analyst has to interpret that graph. Now, if the lab analyst doesn't interpret that graph correctly, accurately, fairly, we have a failure of forensic science. Uh, you know, one example on the collection end, we had a case where um, gunshot residue was a key piece of the prosecution's evidence. And what we learned from uh, video and photo evidence taken at the time of the crime scene um, investigation was that a number of clothing items from a number of different individuals were all put in the same bag uh, with the clothing item that ultimately was tested for and came up positive for gunshot residue. Now that's bad science because we can't tell where the residue initially came from. Um, you know, we've had, as we mentioned before, the urine results that were left out on a counter somewhere for weeks on end. We've had cases, this gets a little more technical, but urine um, in a DUI case, the bladder is a reservoir. And so the first void of the bladder, the first urination, uh, will always have a much higher alcohol content or um, alcohol metabolite content than a second void. And the second void of urine is the one that actually is representative of the blood alcohol content at the time of the urine sample being submitted. Um, that urine from two, three, or four hours ago is an aggregation of all of the urine over the time period, two, three, four hours. So you often have artificially high reports in that situation. Um, you know, defense attorneys need to understand at a high level. You don't have to get down to the granular level. You don't have to know how to precisely interpret these results. You don't know how to make, you don't have to know how to maintain these machines but you need to know what to look for. And it's critical that attorneys take the proper continuing edu legal education that teaches them what to look for in these scenarios. Um, defense attorney needs to know that information so that they can investigate these cases properly and present the defenses that are available and challenge incorrect forensic science in the courtroom um, when, when science fails. Um, and I think it's most important that a defense attorney have that basic background in science so that they can communicate that information to their client. 
because oftentimes we are talking about very complicated issues of chemistry, physics, um, and in some cases, even psychology. And if you can't translate that information to your client, um, you're really doing your client a disservice and not showing them uh, the truth of what the evidence is. And maybe even more importantly, you may be missing critical defenses that are available. That's the reason I think that it's so important that I stay up on scientific techniques. Um, I read various treatises and um, I stay up to date on the most important and, and most cutting edge scientific techniques for these testing uh, that we run into most frequently because I don't want to miss something that sends somebody to prison for 20 years wrongfully. Wow. I mean, those are all fantastic points that you make. And uh, it's really good to know that you, you you really do work on being the smartest attorney in the room and it helps your clients. There's no way it doesn't help your clients because not knowing that information is going to result in a bad you know, a bad thing for your, for your clients. So, um, you know, you're taking the extra time to keep, keep up with that. And that's so important. And so that could be a great example of a question that you ask a criminal attorney, if you're looking to hire one. And if you are in the Ohio area, you should definitely hire, uh, Brian Jones and, and some of the attorneys there because they just do an amazing job. They're very thorough. They make sure that they are up on all of the information before they walk into that courtroom. And you know, they have a checklist of things that they, they look for and they, they know what can go wrong ahead of time because they have been there for trial after trial after trial and they've seen the way things go. And everybody learns from that experience and they bring that experience to you when you hire them. And so um, definitely give them a call if you have any questions on any of those types of cases that we've talked about today. And so, um, Brian, I want to, before I say goodbye, I just want to make sure that uh, I didn't miss anything. We had some basic questions on this, on this topic and you've given some excellent examples. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to mention before we go? Well, first, Erica, I want to thank you for those kind words. I, I appreciate you saying that. Um, what I would like to tell everybody before we sign off today is that forensic science is not just limited to the kinds of cases that we talked about today. Forensic science touches almost every single area of criminal defense. And I would just reiterate what you said a moment ago, Erica, if you're looking to hire a criminal defense attorney, it's critical that you ask them about their knowledge of forensic science and make sure that they have at least that basic understanding, that high level understanding of what to look for. It's gonna be the very rare attorney that can drill down into the granular aspects. And those attorneys are likely to have depth, but not breadth when it comes to forensic science knowledge. So make sure that your attorney has that base of knowledge before you spend the money um, on what can be a very expensive mistake. Absolutely, I think all of that makes sense. And I, I wanna thank you so much for joining us again here uh, we really appreciate all of the information and uh, you know letting us in on the gotcha moments in some of these these cases that can happen. I mean, that's just valuable information. So um, thanks again for joining us, and I hope you have a fantastic weekend. And we're we're looking forward to talking to you again next week. My pleasure, Eric. See you next week. See you.